Good morning, and welcome to This Week Today with Jeff Michaels. Coming to you live from the LCC studios at 2301 Concord in beautiful Lafayette, Indiana. With special guest, Reggie Alderman. Plus, a surprise guest you'll just have to wait to see. And with music by the Normal Sunday Band. And now, here's your host, Jeff Michaels! Oh, it's great to see everybody not here today. Welcome, 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 and happy Easter. I want to welcome you to the first ever This Week Today show where we reflect on the most important issues of the day and tackle them with ancient and eternal wisdom. And along the way, get inspired to keep the main things the main things. Hey, so this whole show is designed for you to share. We want to make sure that you've got an opportunity to take this show and clip it if you want to. Just share it with your friends and anyone else that you've got because we want this experience to bring the message of Jesus to people wherever they are. And especially on a day like today. Today is Easter. Are we going to talk about Easter? Yeah, we'll get there eventually. But first, some comedy. Comedy? Seriously. You see, a lot of times people are afraid of sharing their faith with their friends and neighbors because they're not sure what those people are going to say to them. They're not sure what they're going to say back. In fact, I get a lot of people now and then who tell me why they're not Christians. And one of the big reasons is they say Christians don't have any fun. I mean, they don't go to movies, they don't go to bars, they don't go to parties, and they pray like every single day. Hey! That sounds like everyone these days. You see, coronavirus time has brought all of us to this place where I think we're all practicing it. So hey, you've been living like a Christian. Why not get heaven too? (laughs) And by the way, what better way to spend Sunday than church? No, seriously, you're not doing anything else. You've already binged Netflix, you've watched all of the episodes of that tiger thing, and you've been through your Hulu feed how many times you can't imagine, and then you're sitting there, and I know what you've been doing, you've got the remote in your hand, and you're just flipping right, 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 going through all the Netflix recommendations, and you've spent 40 minutes trying to find something to watch, and there you are back in the 1990s again, back when we all had 120 channels and there was nothing good on. So anyway, today I want to invite you to grab your Bible, and we've got a great show for you. So, today we're going to talk about how to handle fear. Also, we're going to interview a special guest who can help us handle our fear. We're going to have some very special music brought to you by our incredible Normal Sunday Band. So, let's get started right away with some music to help us shift our attention off of ourselves and our circumstances and to remember the power of Jesus' resurrection. Today, wherever you are, open up your hearts to that truth. Realize that God has not left us alone. He has never left us alone. Not even death can stop His love for you. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring 
chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested in my Yeah. 
that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the dark. Hey everybody, so what do you think of the new studio? This is the new uh, This Week Today TV studio that we put together and uh, I'm really kind of pleased with it. it. Works pretty well. And uh, let's just get started. Tonight we've got some great things going on, but the first guest we have is a surprise guest and I'm really excited about this one because we have a guest who has recently become internet famous starting a couple channels on Instagram and Facebook to basically bring some joy to people's lives. And in only two weeks, he's got around 40 followers already. I'm so excited for the amount of joy that uh, this particular guest is bringing into our lives. And so would you welcome the latest internet phenomenon? It's Daily Scooter. <laughs> bringing him out here is my daughter, Kate. Oh, let me, uh, let me see if I can take him. There we go. Scooter, you're so chill. You're so calm. Go ahead and have a seat there, Kate. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about Scooter here. So Scooter is a Havanese puppy. He's black and white, and he just had his eighth birthday a few weeks ago. Here, Scooter, I've got a little treat for you. Look at that. Are you interested in that? Nope, because he's too interested in the desk. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Scooter is a calm puppy. He almost never barks unless someone is attacking our family, which rarely happens these days. And he is a pretty chill puppy, just pretty calm. Here, Katie, let me give him back to you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Scooter. Everybody give him a hand as he goes. One of the passages that uh, is most famous for people in hard times is this verse from Psalm 46. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. One of the things that uh, we need to remember all the time is that we just need to be still. So hopefully you can take a lesson from Scooter, the peaceful puppy, and be still and calm, even though sometimes he's not. Anyway, I want to bring on our next guest. We have a human guest now. This is Dr. Reggie Alderman, a professional therapist, and he is going to be coming to us live by Zoom. So Reggie, I got a couple questions for you. First of all, how are you doing in this isolation? Well, I think, uh, you know, you got Lisa really pulling a lot of weight at the hospital. They're calling in nurses for extra stuff. Uh, David is at the surgical hospital, so they're, they're not so 
you know, their selective surgery, so. That's right, you've got two members of your family in the medical profession now. How are they dealing with all of this? You can't deny it, and I don't think you have a lack of fear. Sometimes, you know, in our weakness, his power is perfected. Uh, maybe when I do have a sense of fear, it's not like I fear with no hope or no faith. It's a matter of I have this Lisa peeking as you get ready to go to work. Yeah, go ahead and grab her. Ask her to come on in and let's chat with her for a little bit. Okay, hey, Lisa, you're there. Yeah, about, about here. Yeah, put your back. Big kind of stuff. That's why I love it. She, she doesn't. Lisa, hi. Hospital. Hey. <laughs> So Lisa, how are you dealing with the fears of COVID these days? How am I handling my fear? <laughs> if I told you, you couldn't tell the church. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, how am I handling my fear? Just, uh, well, of course, you know, keeping your smarts about you and asking God to help with every inch of what you do and know that he's behind you, he's before you, he's on every side, and you know, that's yeah. what I can go on. Well, thank you for visiting with us for just a little bit of time, and okay. we wish you all the best, we'll be praying for you. Let's get back to Reggie. Reggie, so tell me, tell me, you've started a brand new counseling practice right now. This is probably the best time to start a counseling practice, or maybe it's the worst time. I'm not exactly sure, what do you think? Well, you know, I started a new practice and, and starting anything new is challenging. And then this virus thing decided to come around and it slowed everyone down, including uh, counseling and other store, sort of things. Uh, well, even when you offer Zoom or Skype or some sort of teletherapy sort of thing, um, what I'm hearing and what I'm also experiencing is that people that I have worked with before feel comfortable with Zoom and Skype and some of the other things. Uh, I was talking with a friend down in Nashville the other day, and he was saying that, you know, he was getting three and four new clients a day in some cases, and certainly a week. He, since the virus come, he has not, he's gotten one new client. So I, I think when this is over, I think people will want to find ways to reach in, but I'm, I'm hoping that people who know about counseling options that they can trust will reach out during this time because it can be real time for real people, particularly with you know, parents with kids and things going on in the home. And those families where there was already tension, uh, probably this did not help matters. Okay, so let me ask you one more question. So then um, what, are, what are sort of the things people should be looking for in a counselor? I know not every counselor is good for everybody, and I'm sure you're great for most people, but uh, there are probably some people that... Uh, would need a different counselor. What should people be looking for in a counselor? Sometimes the best references come from other people. If you have a friend who has been to a counselor, to a certain one, talk to them. What worked for, for you? Did it work? Because oftentimes they feel very free to be very honest. The other, the other perspective is what kind of counseling are you looking for? Are you looking for a person who actually understands uh, the, the clinical, mental, mental, and psychological makeup of who we are. We're, we're body, mind, spirit, body, mind, soul, however you want to order that. We're not just body. We're not just a spirit. So we have a complexity that God engendered in us. So if a counselor only sees you as a spiritual being and only treats everything that you are as spiritual, they're not even acknowledging the way God created you. You're not just a spirit. If someone only looks at the physical and blames everything physical and throws a pill at everything, they're not, they're denying the fact that there's a spiritual aspect of it. I think all of the above are true. And so for me, at least, I look for a person who's grounded and understands um, truth as we understand it in medical science and understands biblical truth. Um, you know, if I had to vote, I'll trust God. I always vote for God. <laughs> you know, I go trust him because he has proven himself trustworthy. But I think for a counselor, they need to manifest at least not one extreme or the other, but both and. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you sharing some time with us. Now, last up, I want to let everybody know that uh, Lafayette Community Church is paying for free counseling for anyone from our church family 
who wants to see Reggie. So he's doing counseling now by Skype. I'm sure he could also use other technologies if you don't have Skype on your computer or your phone. So give him a call. We'll put the number on the screen and his email address. And I just want to let you know that the church is paying for counseling sessions with Reggie. And we want to make sure that everybody is well taken care of. So you get a counselor and you get a counselor and you get a counselor. You all get counselor or a counselor, I guess, in Reggie. So... Anyway, let's move on. I would like to introduce another song from our normal Sunday band because as we think about this weird time, perhaps one of the big questions that you've got going on in your life is this big question, is God in charge? Can we really trust God to be in charge in circumstances like this? I'm sure that most of us in times like this, we want a real leader. We want a real king. We want someone who has the authority and the ability to take the bad stuff and just knock it out. We want a real king. We want a king who can solve our problems. So, when we look at Jesus, we see a guy who was everybody's expectation of the king in terms of what he could do, healing people and teaching remarkable things. But then, on a fateful Friday, he died. And everybody thought that the king was dead. But Easter Sunday is a time for us to celebrate that he didn't stay in the grave. He came back, proving that he is exactly the king, maybe not the king that we want, but exactly the king that we need. Not a king who is going to solve problem A, B, C, and D, but a king who will solve the big problems, the problems of sin and death. So now... Let me invite you to open up your hearts as you listen to this song from our normal Sunday band. Oh, 
Well, our main topic today is fear. No, not that kind. No, not that kind either. Yeah, that kind. Our main topic today is fear. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, shouldn't we be talking about Easter? Sure, we'll get to that. But this last week, on Wednesday, you weren't thinking, yay, it's Easter week. This Sunday is Easter Sunday. You were thinking, yay, another day at home. Yay, another day trying to do some work. Yay, another day with my kids in the house. All day. You see, the truth of the matter is, if Easter on Sunday doesn't make a difference on Monday through Saturday, then we've been talking about Easter wrong. I'd like for us to spend a little bit of time today talking about one of the issues that we face, and that is fear. Just last week, um, I went to Target, and uh, as I was getting ready to go to Target, we were going to get some milk, and I needed to buy some juice. And Jen said, are you sure you're going to do that? And I said, yeah, I'm going to get some milk. I'm going to get some juice. She said, are you sure you want to do that? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. I'll just go there and grab the things we need and come back. And so I uh, put a scarf around my neck. I mean, the, the weather was perfectly nice last week. And I put a scarf around my neck, and I went to Target, wrapped it around my face, and I'm walking through the store with a scarf on my face. I'm looking around, and very few other people are wearing scarves. Very few other people are wearing masks, but a few of them were. And I made sure anytime someone walked past me, I lifted that thing up and I just, you know, wasn't going to inhale much of their air and I wasn't going to let them inhale much of my air. Is that fear? No, I think that's cautiousness. I think that's just being conscientious. I think it's just taking care of business. Today, my wife made some masks and she went to Target. She's wearing a mask. She texted me and said, hey, Jeff, no one here is wearing a mask. And I said, be brave. Don't be afraid. You see, here's the thing. Fear is the thing that motivates us in a lot of ways. Fear will motivate us, number one, to put on a mask. Fear will motivate us, number two, to take off a mask. Because, see, if you're afraid of the virus, you'll wear the mask. If you're afraid of embarrassment, you'll take off the mask. If you're afraid of some sense that the government is controlling you, you'll take off your mask. If you're afraid of some sense that the government is controlling you, you'll put on a tinfoil hat. These are the things that we do when we are afraid. Fear motivates almost everything that we do. And in fact, it's motivating a lot of things today. I've got some friends on Facebook who are Bernie Sanders supporters. And just this last week, he stepped out of the political race. And so that means they're afraid now. They're afraid. What are we going to do with just a Biden? What are we going to do without Bernie? They're afraid of the consequences. I've got some other friends who are big Trump supporters. And they're afraid. They're afraid. What is this economy going to do to Trump's re-election process? They're, they're afraid. What is this going to do to our economy? What is this going to do to our world? Everybody I know is afraid of something these days. In fact, fear motivates even our lack of forgiveness. We're the kind of people who would say, listen, I don't want to forgive that person. What message will it send if I forgive that person for what they did? Fear prevents us from doing many of the things that we know are the right things to do. I want to take you to a couple passages of Scripture today to help you understand the things from a bigger perspective, from an ancient perspective, from an eternal perspective, so that you can understand better how to deal with your own fear. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 4, he says to his friends, his followers, he says, I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid. It's a command right there. Jesus says, don't be afraid. And I say, Jesus, how in the world can we do that? How in the world can I not be afraid with things like this in the world? Or this? Or that? Or that? Or that? Or that? Or that, or that, or that. How do I not be afraid with all of the stuff in this world that's going on? I mean, Jesus, don't you know? Don't you know? Jesus, I can imagine him saying something like this. Well, what's the worst that can happen? What do you mean, what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that could happen is that we all get killed. The coronavirus takes us all out. The government takes us all out. The economy takes us all out. Jesus says this. I know you're afraid of the worst. So he says in that same verse, 
He says, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. I'm like, Jesus, what do you mean? What is, what is, the, what is the more? I mean, if they kill my body, isn't that everything? If I'm dead, isn't that everything? What is the more that I shouldn't? What is the more that I should be thinking about? Well, see, Jesus does this amazing thing. He's about to tell them what they should be afraid about. He says this in verse 5. Jesus says, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Wow. Jesus is telling his followers that they need to be afraid. He just told them, don't be afraid. And then he said, no, no, what I mean is don't be afraid of those people who can kill the body and then that's all they can do. Be afraid of something else. Be afraid of the one who has authority to throw your body and soul into hell. Jesus says, don't be afraid of the things leading up to death. Be afraid of what's on the other side of death. Listen, I know a lot of people say this. I'm not afraid of falling. It's the sudden stop at the end. Jesus says, here is the principle. The principle for fear, how to handle your fear, is to get a bigger one. The antidote to fear is to get a bigger fear. See, a lot of times our fears are just too small. We focus on the small fear and Jesus says, no, 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 I got a bigger fear for you. You think death is a thing to be afraid about. No, think about eternity. Think about heaven and hell. Think about on the other side of death. That's the stuff to be afraid about. When I was in college, I had uh, football experience. Not that I played football, but that I knew some people who played football. Now, when I was a freshman, I said that I was going to run for class president, and I did. In fact, I won. But while the campaign was still going on, I said to my friends that I was going to be running for president, and my friends said, hey, we've got a thing we want to do. We're freshmen. We're at college. This is our first experience away from home. Let's all shave our heads. And I said, what? Are you nuts? And they said, no, let's do it. Let's shave our heads. Well, I was a little bit afraid of what I would look like with my head shaved, but I was more afraid of what I would look like with my head shaved as I was campaigning for class president. I was more afraid that I would not win the president. And so they all shaved their heads and I said, no, I'm not going to do it, but I will do it after I get elected. Because see, when you're president, once you get elected, then you can make all kinds of weird decisions, right? I don't want to go into that. Anyway, so there I was promising to shave my head, but hadn't shaved my head yet. And election day comes and I get elected to be president and the football team, well, at least the 10 or so football players who were on my floor decided they would take it upon myself to help me keep my promise. So they drugged me downstairs to the lobby of the dorm. They duct taped me to a chair and they proceeded to shave my head. And the entire time I was actually not that afraid because I had promised I would do this and they were just helping me keep my promise. Later that year though, things changed. You see, as class president, my class became uh, the owners of the school bench. The school bench was kind of like a, a mascot or a relic. It's a piece of basically concrete, that if your school, if your class owned it, then you were the bench keepers, and that gave you some sort of prestige. The freshman class never owned the bench until I was president. We acquired it, and the football team found out that we had it, and they started sending me letters in the mail. Jeff, we're going to come and get you. Jeff, you better reveal the bench. You better tell us where it is so we can come and get it. We're going to come and get you. And these are the same guys that duct taped me to a, share, a chair and shaved my head, and I was afraid of what they might do to me. Next. And in my fear, I remember that Easter of my freshman year, Friday night, Good Friday. I was in such a place of fear and depression and worry and all kinds of stuff that I decided... I was going to basically spend the whole night awake trying to follow along with Jesus and his disciples as they were praying. And that next morning, I didn't feel any better. I tell you what, <clears throat> I didn't feel any better at all until I started spending some time with my friends again, started hanging out with my friends again. But what really put me over the edge was that I realized in order 
to get my schoolwork done, I couldn't be afraid of going out of my room. And I had a bigger fear. Fear of the football team was a pretty big fear, but fear of bad grades was for me a far bigger fear. Jesus says this, you are afraid of something too small. You need to be afraid of something bigger. I want to take you to another passage. This passage comes to us from the book of Mark. We're going to be looking at this passage in Mark, and I'm going to actually read it from my Bible for you because I think it's such a, a powerful picture of something amazing that goes on here. In the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 35, it says this, That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories in the New Testament because here is Jesus with his disciples, and they are seasoned fishermen. They are seasoned boatsmen. And now they're in the middle of the lake, and there's this squall that comes on. The wind and the waves are too high, and these guys are saying, Jesus, this is too much for us. Well, Jesus is asleep. I was really hoping for this part of uh, the lesson that I would have Scooter right over there asleep in his bed, but that didn't happen. Nonetheless, Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat, proving the point that he is peace, maybe even the prince of peace. So here's Jesus sleeping in the boat. The disciples are freaking out. They're scared. And they wake him up. They say, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. There's a part of me that wonders if he wasn't just expecting the disciples to be listening in, where Jesus says, Quiet, be still. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And this is my favorite line. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. <laughs> you see, here's the deal. They were afraid of something stupid like wind and waves. Who's afraid of wind and waves? What's the worst they can do to you? Drown you? Kill you? But this dude here, this dude here sitting in the boat sleeping, he has the power to stop the wind and waves? Yeah, Jesus, I know why you're not afraid. I know why you're sleeping in the boat, because you're not afraid of anything, because you've got power over the wind and the waves. But I tell you what, Jesus, I'm afraid now of you. Jesus would say, your fear is too small. You just need to fear something bigger. Why are you so afraid of the storm? The scariest thing here is Jesus. <laughs> the answer to a small fear is a much bigger fear. I want to encourage you to not fear something as small as the wind or the waves or people or a virus or even death because you've got something much bigger to fear. Fear God. That's what Jesus would say. Fear God. In that moment when he displays that he has the power over the wind and the waves, he displays that he has the power of God at work in him, and he would say, don't fear something so small that can bring your death. Instead, fear God. I want to take you to one more passage. And this is the passage that leads us into Easter. It's in Luke. There's actually two sections to this. One of it happens while Jesus is on the cross. One of it happens a few days later. But we're going to pick it up in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. We get to this story as Jesus is hanging on the cross. Some guys are being crucified next to him. It says this, there was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews, no doubt a sarcastic comment from Pilate, saying, Hey Jews, look what happens to people who claim to be your king. It was also a sarcastic comment from the Jewish people. No, this isn't our king. We want a savior king. We don't want that king. We don't want a king who sacrifices himself says this, verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Because see, after all, the Messiah is not a Messiah unless he saves me. 
The criminal was like, I'm not willing to accept you as a Messiah unless you save me. But the other criminal rebuked him. And the words of his rebuke are profound. He says, don't you fear God. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. So your fear is too small. You're afraid that you're going to die. And this person says, no, 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 no. Don't you fear God? You are going to die, he says to this man. He says over there to this other criminal, he says, you're going to die. We're all going to die. This is happening to all of us. We're all under the same sentence. You can fear all kinds of things, but don't you fear God? And then, because this man does fear God, he looks at Jesus. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, he says, Jesus, yeah, you are a king. Don't you, won't you just remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, don't be afraid of the ones who can kill the body. Be afraid of the one who can send you to hell. And then he says to this criminal, Today you'll be with me in paradise. You see, the simple lesson from this part of the story is that the one who fears God is the one who can look forward to paradise. The question for you and me today is, do we trust Jesus' words? This guy here, he's he's on the cross right next to Jesus. He already trusts Jesus. He's seen Jesus. He's seen the miracles. He doesn't know why Jesus isn't getting down off the cross, but he's at least trusting in him. He's putting his trust and his faith in Jesus. Jesus is the king. He says, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus says, I'll remember you today. Today you'll be with me in paradise. What an amazing promise. But for you and me. Do we trust Jesus? And in order for you and me to trust Jesus, we have to get ourselves over to chapter 24. In chapter 24, we are now on Sunday, the day just a few days after Friday when Jesus was crucified. And on Sunday, there's been some weird reports, some weird reports of Jesus making appearances in his body as a risen Savior. We pick it up in verse 33. The guys who just most recently saw Jesus, they get up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and had appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. I love it. Once again, Jesus says, Peace be with you. They were startled and, (laughs) I love it, frightened. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you still have, do you have anything here? to eat. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. What Jesus says there at the end is so amazing. He says, listen, this is what's been promised in the scriptures for centuries. You were afraid it would never happen, but it happened. All of the Old Testament prophecies have now been fulfilled. You were afraid they wouldn't be fulfilled, but they've been fulfilled. It's happened. Jesus says, and guess what? You were afraid that my words to you wouldn't be fulfilled when I told you things like, I am going to go and prepare a place for you and then come back. You thought my words were empty and hollow, but guess what? I came back. Jesus says the Old Testament words were fulfilled. My words were fulfilled. Didn't didn't I even tell you that I would be crucified and rise again on the third day and now I've done it? I'll prove it to you. Give me some food. He eats the food right there with him. God's word was fulfilled. Jesus' word was fulfilled. There is no more waiting. There is no more death because it's been conquered. 
And on top of that, forgiveness of sins will be preached in Jesus' name to all the world. His final words to his followers were that they would be testifying to his resurrection and to forgiveness. God's word was fulfilled. Jesus' words were fulfilled. Death has been destroyed. Sin has been destroyed. Friends, he would say, there is no longer anything to wait for, and that means there is no longer anything to fear. What's the worst that can happen? Death? Ha! Jesus would laugh at that. The worst that can happen to those who follow Jesus is none less than paradise. The worst that can happen to those who follow Jesus is heaven itself. Our fears are too small, that's why we can't handle them. They're like getting a a splinter or something underneath your fingernail. You're like, oh, I just need something smaller to get in there and I'm worried and I'm worried and I'm worried. When all along the problem is just soak your hands in some big vat of water. Let that work the splinter out. Let it happen for you because your fears are too small. You need a bigger fear. You don't need to fear death or sickness or virus or sin. You need a bigger fear because God says, if you fear me and you follow my son, then the kingdom of heaven is open to you. Find a better fear. Take this home with you. The worst that can happen is that you will follow Jesus all the way into paradise. Listen, if you need some more help with that, we'd like to help you out. Here at the This Week Today show, we've got a bunch of people who would love to pray through your problems. Just let us know. Send some information to our office at lafayettecc.org site. Go to our website. Go to our Facebook group or our Facebook page, and you can post prayer requests. I'd love it if you would download our app. Install the Lafayette Community Church app, and there in the menu right off to the side, you can check in and submit your own prayer requests. We want to pray with you during this time. I also want to remind you we're paying for counseling. We'd love to send you to Reggie so that you can get some counseling with him. I'd love you to contact me. You can reach out to me. I'll put my information on uh, the screen or underneath in the comments below. Reach out to me. We'd love to pray with you. We'd uh, We'd love to help you out in these problems, but I'll let you know. Right now, you don't need me, you don't need Reggie, and you don't even need our prayer team. Right now, more than anything, you need Jesus. And I want to invite you. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today is your day. Would you just simply turn your heart toward him, like the thief on the cross, and say, Jesus, would you remember me when you're handing out forgiveness, when you're welcoming people into your kingdom? Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for the ways I have not shown fear for the big fear. Jesus, I'm sorry for the way I have let sin enter into my life. I'm sorry for the ways that I have lived my own way instead of your way. Jesus, enter into my life. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me and bring me into your paradise. Bring me into your kingdom when the time is right. This is your opportunity today and every day, no matter when you listen to this or any other time, reach out to him because Jesus is our hope. Let me pray with you right now. Lord God, we ask that you would move in everybody's heart, everybody who's listening to this or watching this. I pray that you would cause us to be people who reach out to you, who say, we're willing to follow you. We're willing to, we're willing to pay attention to the big things. And Lord, there are lots of little things that we still fear. So Father, I pray that you would just take those off of our shoulders and allow us to put our fear in the right place, a righteous, honest fear of the God in heaven who is perfect and holy and just and who deserves to send all sinners to punishment. But because of Jesus, we have been given forgiveness and freedom. Because of his resurrection, we can know that his promises have been kept and they are true. And so, Lord Jesus, would you move in our hearts? Help us all to recognize you in this time of fear. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, please let us know. Please send us an email, check in to our app, online check in, and let us know what's going on. But before we end our time together today, I want to give you an opportunity to reflect on this. We've got one final song from the normal Sunday band it's Jesus is our living hope.
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my
Well, I want to thank you for joining us. That's all we have today. Peaceful Puppy Scooter is saying goodbye as well. And so he will be seeing you over the internet, as will the rest of us, for the foreseeable future. Can't wait to see you all in person again. We're going to love to have a live studio audience back in this place. But until that time, I want to encourage you to have a great week this week, even today. And God bless you.